Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of the winter maintenance course. My name is Mike Fitch with the Ohio LTAP Center here at ODOT, and we appreciate your participation in this training. As we've done for the past two days, please take a moment to locate the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel. And if you could go ahead and type in your initials and send those to us as our informal roll call for today's session. So I see those arriving already. Thank you for that. Throughout the course presentation, please use the questions box to send in any questions you might have. And I'll be dispatching those periodically to Bruce for, for comment. If you have any questions from the past two days, um, now would be a good time to add those for discussion as we get started for today's session. Uh, looking at the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel, please note that we've updated that section just today with some additional PDF resources that are based on a question from yesterday afternoon. So at this point, we'll ask Bruce Drews to tell us a little bit more about these additional items. Bruce? Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, um, yesterday afternoon uh, in our course, um, somebody had asked about um, some of the uh, winter maintenance plans, uh, if I had some examples of those winter maintenance plans. Um, in your handout section, you'll notice there's an agency winter maintenance uh, plan PDF. Uh, what I've included there is actually um, some web links to, um, I think there's five different agents, four or five different agencies that have a, a plan and these are carried on their web page. Um, and actually one of the better ones that I really like, there's uh, two of them. I've, I've given you the name of the organization that uh, developed the plan and posts the plan and uh, the the top organization on that list is uh, Bingham County and uh, they actually have a um, if you go on the first link it it gives you you know their their public information part of the plan and then the second link is actually their their map describing which which roadways are their connect or collectors which ones are their their primary roads and and that information so you can put those two together and and be able to to get an idea of their plan the other one that i really like is the court lane uh, link that i sent you uh they have a a pretty extensive plan and uh, it works out really well but uh so those are there for you to take a look at and then um you know today we're going to be talking about uh, chemicals, the chemicals that we use on the roadway, and there's a there's a growing list continually of both the chemicals that we use for for anti-icing and de-icing, and we'll talk about those differences here a little bit later on. But um, there's because of that, um, you know, the uh, NCHRP, the the National Center uh, Research Center uh, has developed a uh, guidance document since it's 449, and I wanted to include that so you could take and pull up that that census synthesis and be able to um, preview or go through and look at at the information they provided there. Also, back in about 2006. Um, the University of Idaho, we had uh, contract, I was actually located at the University of Idaho and we contracted with some researchers to do some research on inhibitors. Uh, we we're getting a lot of, of complaints from the trucking industry that um, the salts, the sodium chloride, the magnesium chloride, the calcium chloride were rusting um, their equipment, uh, causing pitting in their wheels, a lot of those issues. And so we actually did the research project on the benefits of, of inhibitors and also actually some of the downsides of the inhibitors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, some of that research, I'll have it in, in the uh, presentation as well. So that's, that's the resources, the additional resources that we added there. Um, what I would like to do um, is, you know, as you take a look at the objectives for our winter maintenance, um, you know, I want you to gain an understanding of how different chemicals work on both dry and snow-covered pavements. 
Um, we we do have some issues and some problems with those those uh, when those uh, liquid chemicals are applied to some some of the dry roadways, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we also have some major issues when some of those chemicals are are not applied correctly to snow covered roadways. We'll describe what is meant by the term a phase diagram. That's a very critical part of the whole method of getting those chemicals to work right. We'll list the benefits of using chemicals on paved roadways. Now, generally speaking, you take a look at the unpaved roadways, the gravel roadways. A lot of agencies will take and use some of the, the uh, uh, stabilizers, which are in some cases the same chemical that we use for anti-icing in the the area of of sodium chloride magnesium chloride calcium chloride um, they're a pretty common type of stabilizer and we use them on the gravel to try to stabilize that gravel and some of the other um, proprietary type of products that we use to stabilize gravel but that that gravel, generally speaking, we do not use liquid chemicals on, and generally speaking, in most cases, we don't even uh, use salt, uh, rock salt on. We'll use, you know, maybe some some abrasive at the intersection, some of those types of items. But if you use a, a liquid chemical or you use a salt type of chemical, it has a tendency to thaw out that gravel and then you start throwing your gravel off into the ditch and uh, and so that's a not a good benefit. We're also going to explain the impacts of using chemicals and abrasives on your roadway. So we're going to talk pretty extensively about that. Before I really get into the rest of the presentation, I'd like to give you a little more background about myself. Um, I was I moved from um, Eastern Idaho to Boise, Idaho in 1996. And the reason I moved is that I was asked to come over to Boise and uh, assist with a technical training unit. Uh, one of the, the activities that I was giving in 96, 97 was to take and the Idaho Transportation Department was being asked by the federal government as well as um, some um, uh, well, actually, it's Compass Chemical and uh, down in Salt Lake talking about pre or uh, applying liquid chemicals to bare roadways. And the primary chemical that they were looking at using was a mag chloride treatment, which is a liquid chemical and you spread. You can spray it down on the roadway before um, the storm comes in and it helps take and keep the, the snow and the ice from, from bonding to the pavement. We had a lot of problems with it. Uh, we we're buying a lot of mag chloride. We bought a lot of equipment to take and apply mag chloride because it was it was quote it's going to be the the uh, cat's meow as far as as dealing with snow and ice. Um, and we had a lot of problems with it in the regards that we found that the chemical had a lot of other things in it. Uh, like strychnine, some heavy metals, uh, some things we really did not want to be shooting on our, our applying to our roadway. And so um, and we kind of started developing some specifications and some requirements dealing with that, those chemicals. And we had a, a very talented chemist that was working for the state at that time. And he was developing a lot of test methods and as part of that development, uh, a group called the Pacific Northwest Snowfighters was formed. And they looked at developing standards and requirements for all the chemicals that are used in snow and ice removal. And now that that whole organization is morphed and you have an organization called Clear Roads. They're in the uh, Northwest part, or the uh, the Midwest part of the uh, country that takes and uh, does a lot of research looking at, at chemicals and the effects of the chemicals. And they have a lot of information on their, their website, which is the Clear Roads website. But so we went through the whole process of developing up some standards and some requirements for the use of these chemicals. And it's interesting because 
at one point, the state of Idaho had actually mandated that any chemical that was going to be applied to the roadway had to be inhibited. And um, then we found that, you know, our salt, you know, went up from from what was at that time about $36 a ton up to $140 a ton, uh, which is a significant increase. Um, and so the state stepped back away from that inhibited requirement. And we looked at application rates. We looked at, at when do you apply it? Uh, those types of issues. And um, so we, we kind of struggled with that whole process. And so that's some of the things I'll be talking about today is, you know, what were some of those struggles? What did we find out of those struggles? Um, what are some of the recommendations? And um, you have quite a selection of different anti-icing chemicals available to you as an organization. But um, one of the things I, I like to stress is that you need to have that specification. What is that chemical? What are the items? Because we see it with beet juice. We see it with the agricultural uh, byproducts. We see it with the oil producers byproducts. All these different products, the products that people are wanting to dispose of if I can use that term, um, you know, they're, they're products that are, are part of a processing system and they want to try and, and figure out how to use them and be able to, to sell them. And so one of the things that I keep telling people, you know, have a specification for your, all of your products you're going to buy and also make sure you get an SDS a safety data sheet showing that that product is safe for the environment as well as your roadway. Because if you're not able to get that information, um, then I might want to suggest that you look at some other type of chemical um, because you may find that that chemical may have something in it that you really don't want to put on your roadway. So, you know, uh, make sure that you, you know what your chemical is. So with that introduction, uh, let's talk a little bit about chemicals. So, you know, most of the common chemicals that we use for snow removal or pretreatment, uh, it's the, the biggest one, and people always call it salt or rock salt or, or some other type of salt. But sodium chloride is the, the, the largest, um, what, most people use. Most people will use some sort of rock salt. Now, rock salt is has changed quite extensively. Um, one of the things that I, I do stress for agencies is if you're buying rock salt, that you have a specification for uh, the aggregate size or the, the salt size as well as the moisture content um, because you're buying it by the ton. And so if you get into a, a situation like I did in in Ashton, in Eastern Idaho one day, I was, had a delivery of salt come into the yard and the, the big truck opened up and raised up its bed to dump the salt in my yard. And the first thing that came out of it was probably, uh, it looked like about 30, maybe 40 gallons of water. And the water just ran all over the yard and, and, uh, and ended up not being able to be used. Well, I paid for that. I paid for that 30, 40 gallons of water thinking it was salt. As, as a, an, an employee and a taxpayer, I didn't think that was quite right. And so make sure that you, you have that specification and that your, your product meets those requirements because the salt manufacturers, they're making salt for the salt shakers that go on your table. They're making salt for, for a lot of other purposes that they break down the salt to, to take the, the chlorides out of it and use it for, for plastics. They take and, and, you know, there's a lot of things that go on there. So that sodium chloride is, is one of the, the salts they're used. And we'll talk more about it here in a little bit. Calcium chloride is another chemical that I know that is used pretty extensively, especially in, in some of the colder types of climates. Uh, and we'll talk about that, that usage of that calcium chloride. Magnesium chloride uh, usually is in a liquid form. Um, and it, there are specifications for that, that 
calcium chloride and that mag chloride. And you need to be aware of those specifications and be able to test for that. Potassium chloride, generally speaking, is not used out on our roadways. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little more corrosive than the other, other three salts, and, uh, and so that it's really not used. Then there's a number of brines that are produced from the gas production industry the fuels industry and those brines um, generally speaking you know they may be brines that were pumped up in with the the oil and they've separated them out and then they take and refine them a little bit and then they sell them to be used out on on the roadway um, uh, potassium acetate is actually a, a product that was looked at as being a really good product it wasn't going to be very corrosive but the problem is, is the 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 temperature span for the the potassium chloride. Um, you know, it's a. Uh, pardon me. Uh, I'm thinking about ma calcium magnesium acetate has a very short short band. Um, so the ca calcium magnesium acetate is really handy to use in places that are environmentally sensitive. The potassium acetate is actually used in in some of the uh, the other uh, like the airports and some of the other types of applications. Urea is a uh, a natural product that comes from the the uh, timber industry, uh, and urea they actually now make a synthetic urea. Uh, it's the same stuff you put in a lot of your diesel motors anymore. The DEF. That's exactly what urea is. Um, and so there's a higher demand for that than there is for putting it out onto the roadway. So you, you don't see a lot of it anymore. Uh, agricultural byproducts, you know, out of the coin industry, out of the soybean, in, soybean industry, uh, the beets, uh, sugar beets, uh, you see a lot of beet oil around anymore. Um, and it's, it's, becoming a little more popular um, and, you know, for a, uh, a pre-wedding type of, of item. Then there's a lot of proprietary products. And generally speaking, a lot of those proprietary products are combinations, uh, mixing a, a, maybe a couple of salts with a couple of other types of, of chemicals to try and enhance that, that chemical. Um, there's a, a whole laundry list of those types of items. So that's basically most of the the common types of items. And then of course there's abrasives. Abrasives have been used for years and will continue to be used because they they do have a use, but uh, unfortunately they're they're uh, then you have to clean them up if you're in a in a metropolitan area or something along those lines. So there's a, an issue with that. So like I said before, that NCHRP report, that 449 report talks about the different types of chemicals, the impact of those deicers on the natural environment, some of the tests that they did in Colorado and some of the other states with them. And so it's a, it's a handy report for you to take and, and review to uh, refresh yourself about some of these different chemicals. So if I could, could I get to question one, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll launch the poll question. Which of the salts is the most commonly used? And we'll give people time to vote. I see the votes starting to arrive. All right. About 70% of the group has voted. A few more seconds. Okay. So Bruce, uh, the group said, 80% uh, of the group said sodium chloride, 3% said magnesium chloride, and 17% said calcium chloride. Excellent, excellent. And, and it's like I mentioned before, you know, the, the most commonly used um, of those three salts is actually the uh, sodium chloride. Um, it, there, there's hundreds of 
millions or actually there's there's a, a millions of tons of sodium chloride that's used all across the United States and in the Canada. Um, matter of fact, in Canada and in parts of the United States, salt was so heavily used that uh, I know I was in in Minneapolis one winter for a uh, a conference and there was salt laying alongside the roadway, you know, rock salt that they dumped on the on to try and deal with some of their their freezing rain and that. But the 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 salt had gathered along the edge of the roadway. And I know that if you go up into Canada in in Toronto and Alberta and um, some of the other providences up in uh, Canada, salt is actually a hazardous chemical um, because they've they started seeing it migrating into the water system, killing the trees, killing some of the grasses and that. So, but, um, so we're trying to take, and, and one of the goals of this whole program is to get you to think about how much chemical are you putting on the ground? Like I'd mentioned in the first day of this whole program is that if a little bit works, that doesn't mean you need to put a whole lot more onto the roadway because then you're you're wasting uh, some of your your funds, your money that you paid for that chemical or that product. The other part of it is is that if you keep putting it down real heavily, <clears throat> sure, you can take and I, I know of a couple of different metropolitan areas where they use so much chemical they can melt the snow right off the roadway. But like I mentioned in the first part of this series, some of the problems they ran into is that the chemicals started getting into the groundwater system, started to take and migrate away from the roadway, getting into the vegetation that was alongside the roadway, killing the trees, killing the grasses, killing, you know, causing uh, environmental damages to along the roadway. And also on top of that, the primary reason that we started to move away from salt back in the 90s is that we'd throw salt down on our bridge decks to take and get rid of the ice on the bridge decks, but we'd end up taking and having the salt pellets, the rock salt going against the curb of the, the bridge deck, and then it would break down and get down into the cracks of the bridge deck and rust the, uh, the, the rebar that's in the bridge deck and cause the concrete to spalled off of the uh, bridge deck. And so we're destroying our own infrastructure because of the amount of chemical we're using. And so we need to take and make sure that we're using the right amount of, of chemical for each type of condition that we're going to incur, whether it's freezing rain or black ice or a snow type of event, a snow floor. Those are all things that need to be considered as you're using your chemical because there's ap different application rates and I can't give you one application rate that's going to work for all of them because each of those actions are going to be a little bit different. So the three primary chlorides like I'd mentioned to you before were sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride. Sodium chloride, um, a couple of things about sodium chloride is for sodium chloride to actually work, it has to have moisture. You have to break that rock salt down to be able to get it to work. And a lot of agencies, what they've actually started to do is to take the sodium chloride, put it into a, uh, there's a, um, a, um, a process where you put it into a tank, you add water into it, you turn it into a brine, and then you can use it as a pre-wetting agent. And it works well that way down to a certain temperature. Then you'll start to, then the salt stops working. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Now, magnesium chloride, on the other hand, in most cases, magnesium chloride comes from, you know, well, a lot of our magnesium chloride comes from the Great Salt Lake. Uh, you actually will see some magnesium being produced when you're, you're um, in all your evaporation ponds that you have around the country or some of the salt mines, you'll see magnesium chloride in with the salt and so they have to remove it. 
magnesium chloride generally is always a liquid and you get it delivered as a liquid and generally speaking sodium chloride you know you're running about 23 percent concentration of sodium chloride for water magnesium chloride you're running you know if the um, if you have a good a good warm summer and the the this the magnesium chloride has taken and been processed, you're going to be up around 32, maybe 30% uh, concentration by weight. Um, now, magnesium chloride is hydroscopic, meaning that magnesium chloride will pull, pull moisture right out of the air. And that's what makes it a good stabilizer on an unpaved roadway is that it likes to pull that moisture that, that you get in the evenings and keeps that ground damp, and so it holds the material together. But that's also a problem in the regards of if you take and you pre-wet a roadway with magnesium chloride, and say the storm doesn't come in, and so that you go back out before the next storm and pre-wet that roadway again, you can actually apply too much magnesium chloride to that roadway. Then when your humidity comes up, it starts gathering all that water and it either dilutes itself down to where it freezes or it floats the material that you have in the asphalt, the the oils and the, the other products and makes that road slick. So it either freezes or it takes and floats that material. So most, a lot of agencies have moved away from the magnesium and are using more of the sodium because sodium isn't as hydroscopic. It doesn't like to pull that moisture out of the air. Now, the calcium chloride, on the other hand, you know, it's both hydroscopic and what is called exothermic, meaning that it, it will gather water out of the air. And then it'll also take, and when it's gathering the water, it will give off heat. So it'll warm itself. Um, but all three of these chemicals has to get water to break them down, get them to start working, and get them to be active. These are the, the, the chemicals that are used the most across the United States. Sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride, depending upon your climate and your environment and um, kind of what, what type of product you're, you're looking at using but they're the most common the most uh, have been used the longest when you get into the the agricultural byproducts into the beet juices to get into the the um, the, uh, the the newer uh, more recently and by the same token, they you need to make sure that those those products, those additions, is it really worth the addition? Uh, here in the state of Idaho, actually, what the state of Idaho has done as far as their roadways, most of the state of Idaho is only using sodium chloride, with a few agencies using mag chloride, or up north using uh, calcium chloride, and they use the sodium chloride as both they they add it. In a brine plant, they'll take and they'll put the salt into it, they'll put the water into it, they'll mix it up, get it up to 23% concentration, and then they'll use it um, as a uh, pre-wetting agent and then use the rock salt as a breaking down agent when you get snow floor, you get some of the ice and some of the other items. So those are the primary types of chemicals that, that most agencies have had some experience with. So like I said, sodium chloride is the most common solid and liquid to use. Uh, we use, uh, here in, in Idaho, we use a lot of sodium chloride, um, both as a solid and the liquid. About 210 million metric tons are mined around the world. Not all of it's used on the roadway, but we use a lot of it on the roadway. You know, about 45.3 million metric tons are mined here in the United States, or through evaporation ponds, about 12.5 million metric tons is mined in Canada, and about 80% of that amount is used on roadways. So we put a lot of salt on the road. Um, and 
sodium chloride is corrosive. Sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride are all corrosive uh, agents. Generally speaking, sodium chloride is fairly inexpensive. Um, it's gotten a little bit more expensive as we're, we're getting, uh, we have less uh, free salt available. Um, and it comes generally as a solid. And like I said, you need to make sure you have a specification on size of, of the salt crystal because you know they taken and uh, I had one agency one year took and and they go down to the Great Salt Lake uh, they're only about uh, three hours away from the Great Salt Lake and they go down to to Morton Salt Company and get their hauls their haul their salt back up to their town and uh, they called Morton Salt Company one day and said hey we're cutting ready to come down and get our salt uh, what type of price do you have and, the salesman said, "Oh, we got really a good deal for you. We got some some salt. We'll we'll almost give it to you. Just come down here and get it." Well, they took it back and come to find out the salt was table salt. It had a a production of table salt that was rejected for for usage in the restaurant industry, and so they sold it to this agency. And but the problem with it is, is there's the the granules were so small that they got any moisture at all on it and it disappeared, it melt away. And so that created a problem for them. So rock salt can be taken and put into a brine. It can be used as a solid. It's common in almost all areas. You need a specification as far as the size and the moisture content. You know, sodium chloride, Highest eutectic temperature, generally speaking, you get down to a, a negative, you can at a 23% concentration of sodium chloride, it can keep ice from forming at a minus six degrees. But it's not very effective down at that because it doesn't stay at that 23% that concentration. Generally speaking, it's an effective temperature for sodium chloride is around 15 degrees. Uh, what I see out on the roadway in most cases is that you get down to, to 20 degrees, and unless you have a wet snowstorm, your salt's gonna stop working. It's gonna just sit there and, th and wait for it to warm up. Wait for that surface temperature to take an increase unless it's a wet storm, then it already has some of that moisture that it needs to be able to take in and, and work. It's endothermic, means that it needs to have extra heat to be able to break down. And that's the reason it has to have free water. So it has to be a, a wet snowstorm or maybe a little bit of rain at the beginning of it, but it's endothermic and it is corrosive, it is corrosive. Um, and so we wanna try and, and make sure that we only use a certain amount of sodium chloride. Otherwise we're gonna see corrosion on our equipment, corrosion on our, our bridges, on anything that has has a uh, uh, iron made out of a steel. So when you look at it, how much, you know, ice will salt, melt and that depends upon the temperature so if you have your temperature your surface temperature is at 30 degrees one pound of salt will melt about 46 pounds of ice that's a lot of ice but when you get down to about 10 degrees it's only going to melt one pound of of sodium chloride is only going to melt about 4.9 pounds of ice. So you see that's a, a real reduction in in its ability to take and, and work and be able to to melt that that ice out on the roadway. So your application rates uh, vary widely from state and depending upon the weather condition. Uh, rock salt, uh, like I said, is used as an abrasive in some areas and also as a brine. 
Um, they mix it in with water and, and put it out onto the roadway. Um, a lot of the times uh, agencies will take and mix salt with their sand. So they can take and apply some sand down on the, as an abrasive down onto the roadway and be able to put a little bit of salt in it. Brines, generally speaking, uh, application rates we see anywhere from 20 gallons, or 25 gallons per uh, mile of roadway up to 200 gallons per mile of roadway. Big difference. But that goes back to my discussion on the first part of this whole program was having a standard and also then taking a look and managing your expectations of your traveling population. Uh, like I mentioned uh, on the first day, I had I have uh, two agencies that I worked with that both of them, they had gotten to the expectation that the traveling population expected the road to be bare during the snowstorm. So they would go out and they would apply chemical like crazy. Matter of fact, one one agency was using a a, a magnesium or a, um, actually a calcium chloride pre-wetted with a magnesium chloride. Well, that is a hot combination or they could melt off any of the ice and snow. But by the same token, their light poles were suffering, their concrete was suffering, their bridge decks were suffering, all being damaged. And um, they had to take and step back from that level of expectation, that level of service. So you need to be careful about that level of service. What type of service are you going to provide? So you take a look at, you know, and generally, anytime you can use a pound of liquid instead of a pound of solid, you're protecting the environment because you're going to have less chemical layer. So you take a look at, you know, one, one pound of brine approximately fills a pint glass, one pound of salt approximately fills this coffee mug, but by the same token, that coffee mug is going to have a higher concentration than what you have in that pint glass. Magnesium chloride generally is obtained naturally. Uh, it's a naturally occurring brine. Um, one of the major sources for magnesium chloride comes up out of the Great Salt Lake. It's a byproduct uh, in the Great Salt Lake. What they're actually after, Morton Salt Company and Compass Chemical, their primary product that they're looking for is potash. Um, they have a lot of, they get a lot of potash. Once the potash is dropped out, they ship the, the chemical underneath the lake up to the northern part of the lake, let it sit in the evaporation ponds, and then they get their salt. The sodium chloride drops out as, it, as the sun beats down on it and evaporates out the, the water. Once they remove the salt, the thing that they have left over is mostly magnesium chloride. They have to filter the magnesium chloride to get rid of the strychnine, get rid of the heavy metals, get rid of those other products that we don't want out on our road. But by the same token, that calcium chloride um, comes, a lot of it comes out of the Great Salt Lake. It's more expensive than sodium. And also the application of it is generally a little different. Uh, magnesium chloride, generally you use a spivy and uh, shoot it down in, in kind of, uh, of uh, rows out on the roadway. Um, you don't want to take and cover the whole roadway with it because then if you don't get the storm, you may get a slick type of condition. Um, so you need to make sure your people are, are trained as far as using magnesium chloride versus the sodium chloride or the calcium chloride. Application rates, 20 to 60 gallons per lane mile. Now, one of the things I tell agencies is that if you look at a bottle of magnesium chloride, you can't tell whether it's a 32% concentration or 22% concentration. They both look the same. So you need to test it. You need to take the and check the specific weight of the, the magnesium chloride so you can determine the concentration. Because if you're buying, if you put out a bid for magnesium chloride and you say, hey, it has to be uh, plus or minus 2% uh, 
but it it's we want it at 30 percent plus or minus two percent and somebody takes and puts a little extra water into it and drops it down to 22 percent can you tell it by looking at no generally not not unless you've done with uh, worked with a lot of magnesium chloride so you need to test it you need to make sure you're getting the product that you've asked for so generally speaking, it's the middle of the three core, uh, chlorides as far as the eutectic temperature, the maximum temperature it can keep water from freezing. So at 26% concentration, it can get keep water from freezing down at a minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It is exothermic, means it gives off a little bit of heat as it takes and, and deals with the water. It's hydroscopic meaning it collects water right out of the air. Those are important items as far as using a, a magnesium chloride that you got to take into consideration. Calcium chloride is available. It can be a pellet form. It can be a liquid form. Uh, generally speaking, it's used in colder climates. It has the lowest eutectic temperature of any of the th three chlorides that are generally used. At 30% concentration, it can keep ice from forming at down to a minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit at 30% concentration. It's the most costly of the three chlorides. Uh, it's also one of the more corrosive of the three chlorides. It's exothermic, it's hydroscopic, meaning that it collects water, and it's corrosive. All three of the chlorides are corrosive to differing degrees. And that information is in the uh, Winter Roads uh, technical report of 060323 that you have in your uh, PDF list. So any chemical that you're going to use, you need to have a specification. You should also receive, and that should now be a SD, form safety data sheet from all your chemical suppliers. You need to take and have certification of what the, the if they've performed any tests, what's the concentration, what's the, the water content, what's the specific gravity. Also take and, and talk to your neighbors. The, actually, the one of the best tools you can do is talk to your DOT. Your DOT is taken and they have an extensive testing program. They have a, also a certification program for all those chemicals. And so you need to talk to your DOT and find out which chemicals do they find is the most effective for your area, your type of activity. So be sure to talk to the, the uh, DOT for those items. Corrosion, all the chlorides are corrosive. And the active ingredient to most of your agricultural products and most of your, your other supplements are actually sodium chloride or magnesium chloride. In some cases, it's calcium chloride that's in there as trace amounts. So I look at, at those three chlorides as the primary base for all of our snow removal all of our chemicals that we're using. So you've got to understand that sodium chloride is going to affect your your steels, your irons, those types of items. The magnesium chloride and the calcium chloride, they have more of an effect on some of the aluminum type of alloys and some of the magnesium. Uh, we use some magnesium in our brake, our brake linings and those types of things. And then magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, it will affect copper when it's electrically charged, when it's electrically charged. And that's in that report, that Winter Roads report that I've got uh, attached there for you. So you can look at that information. So people complain, oh, shoot, you know, my, my aluminum box on my truck is, is getting pitted. Yeah, well, what we found is that each type of aluminum, they put a coating on it to protect the aluminum. And depending upon how thick that coating is, how well it lasts. And then one of the other things we did 
as far as that report is, is we took a look at the inhibitors and we found that most of the inhibitors are a starch product, some sort of a starch type of activity. And it sticks to the magnesium or the calcium, but it also sticks to the vehicle. So one of the recommendations out of that report is those vehicles, those pieces of equipment need to be washed because they stick the the corrosive chemical, the magnesium or the calcium to the the wheel or to the, the box of the truck. And then it will take and the inhibitor will break down because of the sunlight, but the magnesium, the, the calcium or the sodium is still there. And so it'll eventually corrode. So you've got to wash your piece of equipment keep that chemical off of it. The other item that we find with copper, a lot of times, you know, truck drivers and individuals will take and cut into the electrical system to put on additional lights. Those nicks in the electrical system need to be sealed. You need to seal them up with a silicon sealant or some other type of sealant so that they keep moisture out of them. Because if they get in there, the magnesium, the calcium, and, and to an extent, the sodium will take and deteriorate that copper, uh, destroying your electrical system. So they're all corrosive. You take a look at calcium chloride, sodium chloride, magnesium chloride. Calcium chloride is the most corrosive. You know, you look at sodium chloride, then magnesium chloride, Cal calcium magnesium acetate, that's CMA, and then urea. Our urea is being the least corrosive, but is now so expensive that we don't use it on the roadway. Test methods. You need to take an, and establish your test mes methods for each of your products. You want to know what's the concentration of that product. So how much moisture is in it? Um, say it's the salt, the calcium, and the magnesium. Oops, let it kick over on me. You want to know have a gradation, the size of that particle, if it's a solid poly particle. Also do a visual inspection. You know, do an observation when they're delivering it making sure that it's the chemical and the product that you're asking for and it's coming in the, the condition that you want. Your inhibitor, you need to take and make sure that the inhibitor has, if you're putting in an inhibitor, make sure that it's been tested. You know, we find that that these tests, the ammonia and nitrogen tests, the all these different tests, we because we found that a lot of these inhibitors or a lot of the chemicals have these different problems within them. So we had developed a test to look at the ammonia and the nitrogen. We developed a test to take a look at the nitrates. We took a look at the oxygen demand, the chemical oxygen demand, the um, frictional analysis, the toxicity test, looking at whether there's strychnine or other hazardous chemicals in that product. So that should be in your SDS sheet saying, oh yeah, what uh, are, have they performed any tests on these, these products? Uh, and also are they environmentally sound? If we could, could we do question number two, Mike? Yes. All right. So here we go. What must be present for most chemicals to work? Are you there, Mike? Yes. We have launched the uh, we've launched the poll, and uh, we got about seventy percent of the votes so far. I'm not hearing you, Mike. Oh, Bruce, can you not hear me? Hello? Bruce, can you hear me now?
Looks like the poll has ended. Yeah. Maybe we're hearing the poll now. Bruce, we have 9% that said sunlight, 5% said air, 86% said water, and 0% said snow. Hmm. Bruce, can you hear me? I see that you're sharing the uh, poll results, but I'm not hearing you. I don't okay. know what the poll results were. Exactly not sure what's going on, but we'll go ahead and um, uh, continue because it uh, appears my microphone is working okay. Okay, Bruce, um, I'm sorry you can't hear me, but uh, please continue. Okay, not sure, but uh, hopefully what uh, the question was, uh, what must be present for most chemicals to work? And it's water. They all need to have some moisture to be able to enable that chemical to work. And so they either need to get the moisture out of the chemical itself, if it's a liquid chemical, or they have to get the, uh, the, the water uh, out of the snow. If the the snow is taking in and uh, has moisture in it, they need to be able to use that moisture. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about you know how those how those chemicals work. You know the primary thing that we want those chemicals to be able to do is to depress that freeze point of the water. So it take and turn that ice or that snow into a liquid and keep it keep it as a liquid to a lower temperature so that we have time to take and have that that liquid or that moisture run off. Uh, solid types of products, the solid calcium chloride, they're the so the solid sodium chloride, they have to have moisture to break them down and get them to work. So um, if we take a look and let me kick us into our first video. And our video is coming up.
Hey, Bruce, can you hear me now? Hello, Bruce. All right, Bruce, uh, we can't hear you. So, uh, sorry, sorry, folks, and please stay tuned. We're trying to resolve our audio issues. And is your microphone un unmuted? Oh, good. Yes. Can you hear me, Bruce? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Off my my microphone system. So it sounds like we're back up and running. Yes, sir. Feel free to proceed. Thanks. Okay. So you know, in the video that we take. We took a look at uh, that eutectic temperature and that that curve, that eutectic curve. And so, as you take and and look at those chemicals and start applying those chemicals to that roadway, of course, you know, if the the snow has moisture to it, or you're you've applied a a, a chemical that has moisture, it's going to take and start breaking down and start working with that that uh, snow. Now. I've seen it happen a number of times where I'm actually I'm plowing a roadway and I've got a snow floor and uh, it the snow's still coming down but it's it's fairly warm you know it's up in the uh, upper 20s and I've applied a, a abrasive with some salt in it and it's rather interesting because as you apply that abrasive uh, that salt that salt will take and start to break down and it'll melt down through that snow floor until it hits the asphalt and they'll spread out across that asphalt. And so what I've actually seen happen a couple of times is I'll apply my my salt and my aggregate to a roadway. It'll melt down through the snow floor. And then if I reduce my speed of my, my plow truck or reduce the speed of my grader, that snow floor will actually peel right off the roadway after it's sat there for a little bit. Um, and so one of the things you want to take and be sure of is if you're using a chemical, if you pre-treat that roadway, that chemical underneath that snow floor is going to keep working unless you peel it off. If you, you peel it off and you get rid of it, then you're going to lose the benefit of that, that product. Um, but that's the purpose of it, is to break that bond to that road surface, prevent that frost or ice from forming. So generally speaking, if I pre-wet a roadway before a storm, the storm comes in, that first part of that storm, as long as it comes in as snow, is going to react to that chemical I put on the ground underneath. And then if it's a real heavy snowstorm, you know, I'm getting a lot of snow, it's going to build up some snow floor, but what you're going to find is that once the storm stops and it's allowed to sit there for a little bit, that's a lot of that snow floor will come off and you'll be able to remove that snow floor because of those chemicals. So it prevents some of that buildup of that snowpack or allows you to get rid of that snowpack a lot earlier than you would have had if you taken and uh, had that that didn't have that chemical or that product that you're using, you need to take a look at that effective range. Like I said, you know, uh, if you're using like a a product that's primarily a sodium chloride, you're going to be pretty effective till you get down to about 20 degrees. Once it gets down to about 20 degrees, your concentration is not going to be high enough and that snow floor is going to freeze back up until the surface temperature, whether you get sunlight onto the roadway or it warms up the air temperature and the surface temperature starts to warm up, then it's going to take and allow that snow floor to break up and, and go away. 
where you take a look at like magnesium chloride, you know, the effective temperature of that magnesium chloride is down at about five degrees. And so it, it works a little longer as a pre-wetting type of, of agent than what a sodium chloride would. But you have the problems with magnesium chloride that if you apply it onto that roadway and you don't get the storm that dilutes that magnesium chloride, you can have issues with that magnesium chloride um, taking an either floating material uh, up on the roadway or taking in freezing and becoming a slick road. So magnesium chloride, it has a, a, a few problems and you need to be very familiar with it if you're going to use that magnesium or that calcium chloride. Sodium chloride, you don't have quite as much, much uh, there as far as the, the freezing or the issue. What it does is it dries out if it just lays on that roadway and your roadway turns a little white, uh, changes a little color. How fast does it work? It all depends upon the dilution of the solution. Are you getting a lot of really wet snow? It's going to dilute that material, let it keep working, let it take and keep that snow floor broken up. But by the same token, you know, it's it's as it dilutes, it's going to lose some of its ability to break up that snow floor. How much is needed depends upon the type of storm you're going to have, how long you're going to have that storm. And also the same thing with the duration of the melting action. The biggest thing that you'll find on a pre-wetted type of roadway is that that snow floor will break up a lot earlier than it would if you didn't pre-wet. Uh, so you're going to be able to get down to that bare pavement again uh, a lot quicker, a lot earlier. Uh, looking at the, the weather performance. The other thing you need to take a look at, the other criteria is the equipment requirements. You know, rock salt, we've all used a lot of rock salt. We have the, the sand spreaders that, that we can mix the, the, the rock salt in with the sand and, and spread it out. With a pre-wetting, of course, we're going to have to take and have the tanks either on the, the um, to pre-wet the sand, you've got to have the tanks on the sander so you can mix the the liquid in with the sand to apply it to the roadway or if you're going to pre-wet the roadway then you'd have to have a distributor that's going to be able to be set up for that liquid chemical and in those cases generally speaking we'll shoot the it in in the uh, drills you know we'll, we'll shoot it in a, a main stream so we have drill marks on the roadway so we have dry spots and wet spots and then allow the traffic to track it out. Also, you got to look at your storage and your handling. All these chemicals are corrosive and can break down due to moisture. So you want to take and protect them. Um, I know in, in Ohio, you have a number of, of salt barns uh, where you store your, your rock salt. If you're using a magnesium chloride, you know, of course, you'll have it in tanks that you can pump the, the chemical out of, and you need to be able to test it and store it and then agitate the tanks if you start seeing in, in a mag chloride, if it gets cold, you might see some particles starting to settle on the bottom of the tank. Generally speaking, you need to take and, and stir that tank up a chemical in that tank to get it all mixed up and get the the uh, the the free mag chloride that's sitting on the bottom mixed back in, uh, and then you also need to take and and look at the safety. Uh, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, since they're both ex or hydroscopic, if you spill it on your skin, if you take and spill spill it on your boots or spill it on your leather gloves, it's gonna dry them out because it wants that moisture that's in those gloves or in those boots. Uh, you also don't wanna take and have a continual exposure to it. Some of the other additional chemicals you may have to take and, and take precautions with. Be sure you're wearing your, if you're gonna be handling the product, wearing your rubber gloves to take and protect yourself from that product. You don't want to digest these products. They, they're, 
their you know naturally occurring products but by the same token uh they're in concentrations to where you know they'll they'll cause you dis discomfort as far as your your um uh, your stomach and your your uh bowel movements and things like that will make you a little sick. So you don't want to take and digest it. You don't want to get it into your eyes, into your mouth, and into your nose because they, they do like moisture. Now, when you're taking an out and evaluating your snow, you know, structures, you know, it used to be that we'd take and just apply salt and sand to the top of our structures. Well, that was creating a lot of our problems. So on structures, on concrete roadways, you know, we want to take and come in and, and pre-wet that, that structure. And in some cases in Ohio, as well as some of the other states, you may have some structures in the state system that have automated uh, application devices where you take a brine, you have it in a tank next to the structure, when the, the temperature and the humidity gets to a certain level on the RWIS, the road weather information system, it'll actually spray the product out onto the roadway so that it protects it from having ice, black ice, or other issues. So you need to be aware of what segments have that type of application device so you're not double applying the, that product. Uh, look at the different types of vehicles and equipment you may need to have. What is the cost of the additional product or the additional items? And is it worth it for that benefit? What's your level of service for that roadway? And making decisions about what product you're going to use. Like I said, you know, mag chloride, some of the other liquid brines you're going to have to have a, a distributor a distributor for um and then of course a lot of the solids you can use your your um, sand trucks for and be able to distribute that that material with evaluation you know looking at the environmental impacts i know that uh, in uh, montana uh, they had an area that uh, they had a lot of uh, bighorn sheep in, and the sheep started coming down to lick the salt off the roadway. So they ended up having a lot of uh, animal strikes, um, and so they had to change their chemical that they're using in those areas. Over application in the research has shown that when you apply a chemical to the roadway as a wet, as a brine, or you apply it as a solid. Generally speaking, it stays in place unless you plow it off the roadway. And when you plow it off the roadway, that's when you start getting into some of the soil issues, some of those types of problems. So you need to take and make sure that you're handling your chemical correctly. You're only applying what you need, not over applying it and then make sure that it doesn't get into the water system, into the air system, or starts causing problems with the human health. Most of these chemicals are pretty safe as far as, as impacts the human. But you also need to take a look at the availability and the cost. That's the reason here in Idaho, uh, most of the organizations here in the state of Idaho, they, they purchase rock salt, then they purchased also brine machines to where they can make the brine themselves out of the sodium chloride. So then they can take and use their rock salt, their sodium chloride rock salt, put it into the brine plant, make their brine, they store it into tanks next to their building, then they can pre-wet their roadway before a storm event with sodium chloride, and then use their rock salt after the storm event or during the storm event to keep the snow from building up and creating a snow floor. So you gotta look at those, the availability. You also have a number of, of alternatives. You know, there's uh, beet juice, there's, there's the, uh, the, the corn, corn and the soy oils, those, those types of products, but do a performance check on them. Make sure that they're performing correctly and that they're they're worth the money, the extra money you're going to be spending to put them on your road. 
look at the impact to your infrastructure. Are they taking and causing problems with your infrastructure? Are you seeing spalding? Are you seeing um, rusting on, on some of your, your infrastructure items? If so, look at reducing your amount of application, but then you've got a problem if you lower your level of service to the client, you're going to have problems with that client complaining about that level of service change. So you've got to evaluate how well your chemicals are working and then make changes slowly. The advantages of the chemicals, the melting action, being able to keep that snow from turning into a snow floor or keeping it broke up to where it's loose so you can take it and be able to get it away. Because you look at the best driving situation, winter driving situation that you can have is a bare road. If you have black ice, if you have a snow floor, then your drivers are going to have to take into considerations of that. And you may have to, to apply an abrasive to take and be able to provide traction. Chemicals, uh, your sodiums, your your salts, they're fairly low cost. Um, there are enhancers that you can take and, and buy from your, your suppliers that are supposed to enhance the ability of the salt, the, the sodium chloride or the mag chloride. Um, but look at whether you're going to gain enough of a benefit to use that, that enhancer. That enhancing type of item. The thing with the chemicals, generally speaking, you know, when the, the snow leaves, when you're done with the snow, the chemical, you may have some residual chemical laying there on the roadway, but it, all the chemical that traveled off the roadway is diluted enough to where it's not going to be any major harm as long as you haven't over applied. Generally speaking, you won't have a cleanup the chemical will break down and you won't have any problems. So it enhances the safety, reduces some of the liability that you're going to see. So you need to be aware of the chemical terms, you know, the percent of weight of chemical in the solution. Like I said, you know, you're going to be looking at sodium chloride, it's about 23%. Uh, magnesium chloride, you'll be up around uh, anywhere from 20, nine twenty eight percent up to about thirty two percent uh the calcium chloride you know you'll be up around thirty percent on that um, be aware of the eutectic temperatures where are they going to work and what temperatures are they going to work um, I know some agencies will take and use rock salt as an abrasive and if that they're applying that rock salt at uh below that 20 degrees temperature is that that rock salt's not going to break down and be able to break away that snow floor it's going to just lay there and then so you've got to be aware of that that eutectic temperature be aware that the um, that the exothermic activities of the the mag chloride and the calcium chloride and also the hydroscopic that they like moisture so when you're using those chemicals, these curves you need to be very aware of. You take a look at the uh, round clear dots, that's sodium chloride. You can see that it gets down you know, about minus five degrees at the maximum concentration. And if you're within that curve, you're gonna be in good shape. But if you're outside that curve, that chemical's gonna stop working. So these are all the curves, the different eutectic temperatures for the different types of chemicals that we use um, in, in most of the different parts of the United States. Now, magnesium brine, uh, generally speaking, what we would do with magnesium brine is test the magnesium brine by using a hydrometer. It's a, uh, a tube that you take and you put into a a beaker full of magnesium brine and it'll tell you the specific gravity of that magnesium brine which then according to this chart you can take a look at the specific gravity figure out what the percentage of of concentration by weight is 
And then you can also determine what the freezing point of that product is going to be at that concentration. So make sure you have a testing mechanism for your chemical that you're planning on using. Here's the uh, eutectic, uh, uh, not the eutectic, but the hydrometer, saltimeter um, chart for the uh, sodium chloride. Um, you'll have that in your, your presentation, your Adobe Acrobat file. So you can take a look at it if you're going to do a uh, salt brine. And you can see the 23% concentration, you know, you're gonna have a, a minus six degrees. The other thing, if you notice, if you get down into a 26% concentration, that temperature that it's going to, to turn solid at increases at that, that uh, concentration. So generally speaking, most agencies will go to a 23% concentration and then let it dilute itself out um, as far as using it as a brine. Here's a uh, chart showing uh, chemical comparisons, you know, uh, concentration by weight, eutectic uh, temperature. Um, but here in this chart, it shows the effective temperature of that sodium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, all those different chemicals. And there's a big variation in that effective temperature. So dilution of that concentration is very critical. Uh, knowing where your chemical concentration is, what type of pavement temperature, what type of temperature you are applying it onto is also very important. So a lot of agencies may have a, um, a pavement temperature sensor out on their mirror, their vehicle that gives the operator a pavement temperature so that they can take a look at what type of concentration are they putting down, what type of temperature are they putting on to make sure that that chemical is going to be able to keep that snow or that ice from getting hard, getting solid. So material uh, percentages determine the percentage by specific gravity. And of course, water is a specific gravity of one. A 30% concentration of magnesium chloride has a specific gravity of a 1.283. And uh, I gave you that, that uh, slide with that uh, chart for the magnesium chloride. Right here is, uh, this is magnesium chloride. So you can look at your specific gravity and see what your concentration is. Whenever you have any product delivered, make sure that you take a look at the name of the product, the supplier, the manufacturer, the destination, the quantity, the lot, lot number, and making sure that they list the concentration of the product or the how they're meeting your specifications. If it's rock salt, they need to take and say that they're meeting the uh, gradation size specification and also the moisture specification. Um, because if they don't list that, then you may have a product that's out of compliance. You need to take a look at those bill of ladings and make sure you're receiving the product that you're requesting. Do field inspections, document the product that's coming in, record the volume that you're, you're receiving, uh, Grab a sample. If it's uh, sodium uh, chloride and it's a rock salt, it's easy enough to get a sample, put it into a, uh, a plastic jug. That way you can take and have it tested to make sure that it's meeting your requirements and then, uh, then accept or reject that, that product if it meets your field inspection. Anti-icing versus de-icing. De-icing is the removal of snow and ice from the roadway after it accumulates. And we do that all the time with our plows, our motor graders, our loaders, our other types of, of pieces of equipment. It's the most effective way 
to remove that solid material, it's cost effective, but it's also performed during the snow event. And a lot of the times the, the snow and the ice will start getting hard or packed down and it's really hard to remove it. So at that time, generally speaking, we might apply a solid in the form of rock salt or some other type of solid to take and try and help break up or keep that material broken up. The thing you need to remember about de-icing if you're applying a solid, don't come in and, and plow it right off because then you're going to waste your product. You've got to let that product break down, that, that rock salt break down and travel down through that snow floor before you're going to be able to remove it. Um, I've seen it happen a number of times where somebody will apply a sodium chloride to a, an ice floor and then come back and plow that ice floor just a few minutes later. You've got to let that salt work, otherwise you're wasting your product. Anti-icing is considered a proactive approach. And what you're doing is you're actually using a liquid. It's either a sodium chloride, a magnesium chloride, a calcium chloride, or a, a beet juice or some other type of liquid. And you usually spray it before the storm event. Perform before that storm event so that as that snow builds up, it takes and starts breaking it down. And then it gets to the point to where it's diluted and it gets cold enough that it freezes. You'll get a snow floor. But then once it warms up a little bit, that chemical starts to work again and your snow floor will disappear. You'll get rid of your snow floor a lot sooner. And so you'll get to a bare road a lot quicker. You can take and come in. I know in a couple of jurisdictions where they apply a, a liquid chemical pre-storm, then as the storm started building up some snow floor, they would take and apply some chemical on top of that snow floor. If you apply a liquid chemical, you have got to apply an abrasive as well. Otherwise that, that snow floor will get very slick and you'll have some major issues with it. So generally speaking, what most agencies will do, they'll apply, apply a brine before the storm event. Then as snow floor starts to accumulate, they'll come in and put down an abrasive with a rock salt mixed into it or, or calcium chloride mixed into it. And that calcium chloride will gather enough moisture or that that uh, salt will gather enough moisture to continue working to keep that snow floor from building up. So that'd be a, a total storm approach of taking a look at applying a brine at the beginning of the storm, a combination type of activity, then coming in and using a, a brine and your abrasive and your salt or your solid to keep that material and keep that concentration up to where you can keep that snow floor from being able to form. So you've got to make a decision as an organization, which chemicals are you going to be using, how best to use those chemicals in an effective, uh, efficient manner uh, as you're taking and, and applying those chemicals. So that would be total storm management, taking a look at, at how you're going to take and come in and what's your level of service, what type of chemicals are you going to use, do you have the equipment to apply the chemicals that you've de you're deciding to use, do you have the sanders, do you have the, the uh, brine tanks, do you have the, the, the distributors to be able to spread the brine, before the storm and then take a look at doing your total storm management of applying the brine before the storm event take and then as the snow floor starts to develop maybe applying some solid pro product maybe a pre-wetted aggregate or a pre-wetted calcium chloride or a pre-wetted uh, sodium chloride and then let those products work 
and keep cutting down that snow floor. And as that, that snow floor builds up, applying maybe some more dry chemicals to keep it loosened up and keep it so you can remove it a lot sooner. Keeping the traffic moving and also the uh, roadway in best condition that you can. So what we've got is we've got a number of tools in our toolbox. We've got our plows, our motor graders, our loaders, our pickups with the plows. Those are all one of the tools that we can use to take and move the snow and be able to push the snow and haul the snow. We have abrasives. Now on gravel roadways, we use you know a fair no number of abrasives and our paved roadways, we may use abrasives for tr added traction. The problem with most abrasives is that that abrasive won't um, stay in place very long unless you pre-wet that abrasive. And we'll talk about pre-wetting here in just a moment. The other tool that we have are the solids, the brines, and the combinations of solids and brines that we use to take and try and keep that snow floor from building up, trying to keep the ice, the black ice. So we actually had a uh, a research project here in Idaho where we took and we had a uh, a roadway that ran along a river and we kept having a real problem with black ice because what would take place is the river would be still warm and at nighttime it would put moisture up onto the roadway because of the moisture in the air and it would stick to the roadway. Well then towards morning that moisture would freeze and form black ice. We found that by taking and coming in with a mag chloride treatment or a combination of a mag chloride sodium treatment, put it on the roadway, that would break up that black ice, but yet it, would dilute, it wouldn't dilute the product. It, the product would stay on the roadway. So it, it would keep the black ice from forming for four to six days after the application. So we needed to monitor it and make sure that our chemical was still active. So we didn't take an over, over apply our chemicals to our roadway, but it dealt with that black ice very well. What do I mean by abrasives? It's that sand, that gravel, that other product that we take and we use to take and put down on our roadways. Uh, it could be sand, cinders, ashes, crushed rock, um, generally speaking, we have some sort of specification for it, and it's small enough that it's not going to cause major problems with the cars, you know, chipping windshields and those types of items. But we do have some environmental concerns with it, especially after the storm event is over. Then we've got to take a look at cleaning up and dealing with that that sand. So you know, the abrasives have they're effective but they're only effective for a short period of time because the cars will have a tendency to kick them off the roadway. So we not only have the cost of the abrasive, but we also have the cost of cleaning them up and reapplying that abrasive over and over and over, uh, especially if we have a, a lot of snow floor. Abrasives are normally spread out of a, out of a uh, sanding box uh, we have, uh, most of us have uh, sanders that we use pretty extensively. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. They're easy to apply. They do apply some skid resistance, but by the time you get two, three, four cars that have ran through that abrasive, you've kicked the abrasive, you're kicking the abrasive out of the wheel tracks. And so you're going to have to come back in and reapply that abrasive later on. We do a mix that abrasive with salt a lot of the times. The other thing we can do is pre-wet that abrasive to be able to get that abrasive to seat into that snow floor a little bit and hold and be able to provide traction for a longer period of time. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Some of the disadvantages of those abrasives, of course, you know, there's no real you get a little bit of melting action maybe from the color of the aggregate. 
Um, you may see some a little bit of melting action, but not a lot. It's easily scattered off the roadway. If your bracing is large, like we use in some of our mountainous regions here in, in Idaho, uh, you'll see some chipped windshields because the the vehicles kick it up and, and it comes in and, and hits the people in the windshield. You might see some air pollution. Um, you know, if you're in a, a non-containment area, you know, they're going to be wanting to control how much abrasive you put out there because once the snow leaves, you have all that that dirt or that gravel or that sand on the roadway, and generally they'll have some water or some uh, dust come off of it as the roadway dries out. Uh, we actually had a real problem with uh, an abrasive we used in uh, Eastern Idaho, which was a uh, a cinder, because the cinder would break down and it tracked really badly, and so you'd end up seeing it tracked down to the sidewalks, tracked into homes. You'll see it, you know, some real issues with it. So abrasives have some disadvantages to them. They also can take and cause problems with our drainage system as they're, they're washed down into the uh, storm drain system. Also may require some cleanup alongside the roadway after the winter is over. So they have some additional costs. Solids, generally you'll see an abrasive uh, less costly, the rock salt being less costly. Uh, we have the equipment to take and deal with them. They dilute a little slower because they have to break down and turn into a liquid. They have some initial skid resistance. The liquids, um, you know, they they act, react instantly because they already have that moisture present. Uh, the liquids aren't displaced. They may be tracked but generally speaking, they stay on the roadway and let, until they get enough moisture to actually wash them off the roadway and then they're diluted to where they don't cause a problem. You use them directly and you can use them on solids, on your abrasives. Solids, you know, need moisture. It'll take a little bit of time. You've got to let them work. Liquids are mostly water, not useful on ice or snow floor, unless you apply an abrasive with it. Rain will wash it off the pavement. That's one of the problems we run into a number of times. If we have a, an early year, uh, early season storm, generally speaking, it'll come in and it might be rain at the beginning. Applying a, a, a pre-application, uh, isn't cost effective if you have storm a uh, rain coming in first because it'll wash it off the roadway and it won't be in place to work so that creates a problem uh, with the magnesium chloride and the calcium chloride the liquids can cause you a slippery condition if they're taken and laid there and you over apply them or they take and get diluted to where they freeze at a lower temperature. So the liquids do have some problems and you need to be aware of the temperature of the pavement. Successful application of a liquid depends upon the weather forecast, the temperature and how the moisture is coming in. If the moisture, like I said, is going to come in as rain, you don't want to do a pre-application before the storm because it's just going to wash right off. Look at your basic strategy. Know how the chemical is going to work. Have a plan and make sure your employees are trained on how to properly uh, apply those chemicals and when to apply them and that they don't over apply them. Sodium chloride is used as a solid, so is calcium chloride. Generally speaking, they're, they're added with the, uh, the uh, aggregate, then they're, they're spread out through a sanding truck, can spread across the road, usually in the middle of the roadway, spread to the outside so the, the uh, traffic will take and, and be able to travel on them. Solids are usually low on low traffic volumes, 
soft snowfall conditions, keep that, that snow being uh, loose, you're getting that, uh, that chemical, that's that sodium chloride or that calcium chloride broken down so it can keep that snow floor broken loose. Um, during that storm event, those solids are applied to help melt some of the snow and keep that snow floor from building up on you. Brines, usually we've taken, we use a spray nozzle. Uh, generally speaking, we'll use a, on most of our liquid chemicals, we'll use a streamer tube. Uh, the sodium chloride can actually be sprayed out of a, a distribution, you know, a spray nozzle. Um, your mag chloride, your calcium chloride as a liquid, you want to take and use streamer tubes to take and put them into to row so you don't take and cover the whole pavement with a with the chemical because then you you'll have a greater chance of having a slick type of issue. Anti-icing prior to the storm, place the dry brine directly to the pavement. Uh, like I said, most times you're using a streamer tube. Melts the snow as it falls, maintains bare pavement for a longer period of time. And then once you do get the snow floor, it will actually break down the snow floor at an earlier period of time when the weather warms up a little bit. Oh, let's see. Applying a liquid to a solid. Like I said, pre-wetting your your um, rock salt or your your abrasive that you're going to put down on the road once you get a snow floor takes and helps hold that that uh, gravel in its current position keeps it from taking and being kicked off the roadway. Also, when you throw the, the pre-wetted material down onto the roadway, it keeps it from spreading out as far across the roadway so you don't throw it out into the ditch or you, you get it a better application. So how that works is if you have a snow floor and you apply a dry sand, or dry rock salt and the temperature is cold, that rock salt or that sand is just going to sit on top of that snow floor. By pre-wetting that aggregate or that salt, you're going to actually take and be able to embed that material down into that snow floor a little bit so that it's able to take and hold in position when the cars run over it and kind of makes it perform like a, a sandpaper. If it's a if it's a rock salt and you pre-wet the rock salt, you're going to give it that moisture that it's going to need to be able to get down into that snow floor and break that snow floor up. Can we uh we're running just a little bit late, Mike, but can yeah. we do question number three? Bruce, can you hear me? Okay, we have launched the question. Okay. I've, I've lost your voice again, Mike, but um, I see you've got the poll question going. Yep, we'll give people time to respond to the question. Hi, Mike. Hey, Bruce. So uh, people are responding. We've got about 65% um, of the group has voted. And we'll give a little more time. Okay, we're close to 80%, very good. So let's see what we have. All right, so Bruce, 24% said keeping them in place. 12% said less bounce. 64% said kickstarting the process. 0% zero zero said purchasing more chemicals. Excellent. So it appears that you you've um, you understand the whole process of pre-wetting of keeping the the material in place, not having the material bounce all over the roadway and having it loose, and also kickstarting the process. Um, excellent, excellent job. Let's see. So like I said, less bounce and scatter, faster reaction time, more effective melting action, you know, less material needed as a result because we were able to keep the material in the location and be able to keep the, 
the product working correctly. Provides uh, wet, wetness provides a solution that causes the abrasives to stick to the roadway, uh, enabling us to take and do the work. This is actually a part of a, a research study that they performed, taking a look at a, an abrasive uh, as a dry abrasive spread on a, uh, a snow covered roadway. You know, you you only keep about 46% of it in the center. You have about 12% on the uh, towards the shoulder or towards the outside, and then you end up losing about 15% of your your abrasive off the roadway. By pre-wetting, you change that whole equation to where you maintain about 78% of the material behind your, your piece of equipment, and then uh, about 9% out towards the shoulder, and uh, possibly about 2% off the roadway. So you're keeping more of your material on your roadway by pre-wetting. Okay. This is actually an interesting set of pictures. You take a look at it here, you have a two salt particles. You have a salt particle that's dry over on the left-hand side of the picture. You have a pre-wetted salt particle over on the uh, left-hand side, or right-hand side of the picture, uh, your pre-wetted salt. Take a look at it after a short period of time, and you can see that the pre-wetted salt has already started melting down into that salt block. Um, and as it melts, it's gathering water, it's taking and breaking down that, that piece of salt. It travels down through that salt block. And as it gets down toward, whoops, gets down towards the bottom, what you'll actually find is that piece of salt will drop right down here to the bottom and then start forming a, uh, a or spread out against that, that uh, pavement underneath that snow floor, weakening up the uh, bond of that uh, snow floor. So pre-wetting actually just uh, speeds up the whole process. Uh, I want to skip down through this a little bit. Um, combinations of treatments, you know, the combinations of abrasive, brines, and solids may be necessary to manage the storm. So like I, I've said a couple of times, you know, come in, apply a brine before the, the beginning of the snow, then taking a look at, at applying a, a pre-wetted um, salt or a pre-wetted aggregate uh, as the snow develops. But you want to take and make sure that you're, you're allowing that snow or that uh, salt or that chemical to work. Give it some time, let it work, you know, and then and once the snow uh, stays kind of loosened up, then you can plow it off and and uh, get rid of that that loose stone, that loose snow. So you know, you take a look at cost of snow removal economics. You know, traditional method where you use just abrasives. You have the cost of the sand, the cost of the plows and the sanders the storage of the material, uh, cleanup, because you gotta come in and, and clean up some of the aggregate, some of the sand uh, versus the chemical. You have the cost of the chemical, cost of the spreading equipment, storage of the chemical, and then the labor to apply it, but you don't have the cleanup um, because the chemical will take and dissolve and, and disappear some of the other advantages versus disadvantages of the different chemicals. Post-storm post benefits of the chemicals, of course, you know, being able to get to that bare road pavement uh, quicker, uh, you reduce some of the environmental impact and also uh, overall storm, um, you minimize some of the costs and then also the major thing is trying to keep that road serviceable because the the best situation for your agency is to have a bare road. Um, so your level of service is improved. You're able to take and maintain your level of service, which reduces some of your liability or and keep the expectation of the traveling population uh, to your level of service. 
So as you take a look at, hmm, as you take a look at, you know, other resources, uh, of course, there's the ASHTO uh, ROS anti-icing CBT that we talked about yesterday. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the Clear Roads organization. Uh, they do a lot of work there in, in Ohio and in uh, some of the neighboring states. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you can contact me and, and visit me, with me if you have any questions or any additional concerns. Um, I actually had a, a couple of other videos I've skipped over because of our, our time restraint, um, but uh, they are in the program. And so you should be able to view them a little bit later on about uh, applying chemicals and also the uh, the uh, dilution of solution. So my objective that I started out this program with to gain an understanding of how the different chemicals work, both dry and snow covered pavements, describe what is meant by the term a phase diagram. That's that dilution of the solution. How, where is that, that chemical going to work at? List the benefits of using a chemical on a paved roadway and explain the impacts of using chemical and abrasives on your roadway. So have we uh, any questions on any of the information I've covered so far? Hey, Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. We have a question from Shannon who says, what is the most common pre-wetting chemical added to rock salt? Bruce, I don't think we can hear you through your headset. Let's see. What oh, happened. you're back. You're back. Okay. I'm back. Okay. I must yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and start with your answer if you could. Yes, the it sounded like the question that you asked was, "What's the most common chemical used as a as with the abrasive?" Um, as a solid, uh, I see a lot of sodium chloride is the most common chemical. I have a few agencies that actually add calcium chloride to their abrasive to put it out onto the roadway. Now, as far as, as to pre-wet your abrasive, the, you, um, you use the brine, and generally speaking, the brine I see used is, is I've seen sodium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, also beet juice, and a couple of the other proprietary type of products used to pre-wet the uh, aggregate, aggregate to get the aggregate to seat. Uh, so there's a whole a number of different types of products that are used that way. Um, I would like to re-emphasize that, you know, uh, I have a number of agencies I work with that, that take their rock salt and then they'll make their own brine. Um, a lot of the state DOTs are starting to do that more and more. Yeah, and he was asking about the most common pre-wetting chemical added to the rock salt. Okay, and in that type of situation, it's either, generally speaking, a salt brine that they may have made at 23% concentration or a mag chloride brine to their rock salt. Thank but you, most Bruce. Most of the time, it's a sodium chloride brine. Okay. Um, we have the questions box open. Are there any other questions either from today or the past two days? And we'll give everybody a little bit of time. We have a few thank yous coming in, Bruce, which oh, is nice. Thank you. That's always <laughs> nice. Uh, while we're waiting for any final questions, Bruce, do you want to mention any closing comments or other items? Um, primarily, uh, this the the this program this whole uh, winter maintenance um, program I've really enjoyed teaching it. Um, of course, it's always a lot better when I'm in person. Um, but by the same token, this format works out fairly well. 
Um, it's just I, I cover so much material so quickly. Um, and so I apologize if if um, if there's some confusion or, or concerns that way. But uh, I really appreciate the the uh, Ohio LTAP, uh, both Mike, Vic, uh, Victoria and Pamela, uh, or I mean Paula. Uh, I appreciate all the work that you do to, to set these programs up. And I also appreciate all the uh, attendees themselves uh, for hanging in and listening to the program. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we get have a little glitch, and I apologize for that glitch. But um, it's uh, it's been a great great class. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Bruce. And I just want to mention we have additional thank yous that have come in from Donald, James, Colin, Laura, Damon, Michael, and Linda. So. Uh, very positive comments about this training. Uh, thanks, Bruce, great presentation. Thank you very much, very informative, great presenter, and I certainly agree with that. So uh, on behalf of the Ohio LTAP Center, we really wanna thank Bruce Drews for teaching this winter maintenance virtual course. We really appreciate it, and thanks everyone for participating. We hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.